Well, good evening, everyone. It's Amy Dacey, the Executive Director of the Sign Institute of Policy and Politics here at the American University. We are excited to have you join us this evening. If you can even imagine that it was a mere seven days ago, it was election night and we were accounting and tabulating and so much has happened in one week. We are so grateful that tonight, Janet Rodriguez, the White House correspondent from Univision, and I think even more importantly, one of our Sign Institute Spring Fellows in 2020, is going to lead a discussion with one of her colleagues, Ed O'Keefe, who's the political correspondent at CBS News and also them both proud alumni of American University. We're gonna talk about what's happening now, what results from the election. So Janet and Ed, if you both wanna join us, I will let you tell us where are we now? Hi, Amy, thank you for that introduction. Hi, Ed, thanks for joining us tonight. And I really thought we would be here today when we uh, told you that uh, to our audience that we would be doing this in the spring we told you we would be here a week after the elections to recap everything that had happened. I thought we would be analyzing the elections, the voter turnout, why, what we might have learned, but here we are as President Trump likes to repeat over and over again, the election is far from over. We have a president elect, but we also have a president that refuses to admit defeat and concede. And the balance of power in the Senate will not be decided until January. So it's far from over. And just today, President-elect uh, Joe Biden said from Wilmington, Delaware, in a press conference that it was an embarrassment that President Trump will not concede. And President Trump, backed by the Republican leadership here in Washington, continues to allege voter fraud and says that he will be ultimately proven right and remain in the White House. So this is where we stand right now. And I do want to bring in Ed because you have been in Wilmington following all of this and you are the inside man in the Biden campaign. So how are you, first of all? Alive? Well? Uh, alive well, but exhausted. Um, the last week or so has been like the equivalent of four weeks. Um, and it's incredible. We were writing our script for tonight's CBS Evening News, and initially we wrote, four days since he declared victory. And someone was like, no, it's only been three days. And I was like, God, it feels like it's been a month already, and it's only been three days, um, because a lot has happened, not only in our own lives as we adjust to this, but obviously in, in the country, as, uh, as we continue to sort out how this is going to go, and, um, you know, and, and the transition to a new president begins. Right, and let's start there because you have been covering the Biden campaign from day one. What do you think, um, how do you think, and how do you think from your sources, what are they telling you and how they're dealing with this refusal from President Trump to concede and more so from the refusal from the general uh, service um, office, the general Administ services administration uh, to actually draft the letter that says that the president elect is Joe Biden, therefore he should start the transition and have access to the federal resources. Yeah. Well, this? So they're frustrated. Uh, privately or behind the scenes about all this, because, you know, in many ways, the transition really began several months ago over the summer. There's a law that requires that the presidents, the current president, begin to tell his administration, hey, there's an election coming. I might not win. Here's what you have to do uh, to begin preparing for the possibility of that. Get your ducks in order, start putting some paperwork together, figure out who would meet with the transition teams once or if they have to come calling after the election. So that was going smoothly. And the Biden-Harris team have had a transition office in place in Washington for several months. Uh, they've got about, I think it's 10,000 feet of, air, of office space in the Commerce Department downtown if they need it. But they, like all of us, have mostly been working and meeting virtually. And they'll probably access that in the coming weeks as they start to focus on some more sensitive stuff. What was supposed to happen, or what is normally supposed to happen, is that after an election is essentially called, even as the states are continuing to do their count and certify the results, and even as the states are preparing to cast their electoral college votes, the head of what's called the General Services Administration ascertains a winner. We don't use the word ascertain too often, but you do in this case. The GSA is this obscure agency that oversees federal real estate, contracting, logistics, 
and they're responsible for the nuts and bolts of a presidential transition. So this administrator is just supposed to sign a piece of paper. It says, yep, good to go. They get about $6 million to set this up and the, what they call agency review teams, or I think the Trump folks call them like agency onboarding groups or something, head into all these different places and literally start lifting up the rugs and um, you know figuring out what's been going on and who's still there. And what is the Trump administration trying to finish here in the next few weeks before they leave? And what should we discontinue? What should we continue? None of that work can happen. More critically, they can't get access to secure facilities. They can't get access to the State Department to help facilitate their calls with world leaders or to offer translation services or to maybe say to the president-elect, hey, when you talk to this guy, don't mention that because he's not friends with this, you know, all that kind of stuff. Much of which uh, Joe Biden would be familiar with given all his work in the past but he may not have the freshest update. So it's frustrating for them. But today in his news conference, the former vice president said, look, I see no need for legal action. The president can you know, do what he needs to do, but ultimately on January 20th, I'm gonna be president and we're gonna sort this out. So he's kind of trying to stay above the fray and be the happy warrior and say, look, kumbaya, everyone come together, we'll, we'll sort this out. When in reality, underneath, there is some real frustration, concern and worry that the longer this drags on, the more problematic the launch of a Biden administration could be. Well, because you also only have 70 some days to be able to make this transition happen. And you don't wanna to get to the White House and they they won on January 20th without having done any of this legwork. Right. And, right, and everyone since 2000 has cited that transition and what happened only about nine, 10 months later on 9-11 as a good example of what can happen if a transition doesn't happen. The 9-11 Commission report went back and of course studied what had happened in the months leading up to the attacks. And they concluded that because of the truncated 2000 transition when Bush and Gore were fighting over the future of, or over who won Florida, certain things may have been missed in the national security com uh, community that compelled them to not be on top of things such that nine months later there was an attack. So quietly, you got a lot of people in Washington sort of saying, hey, remember what happened 20 years ago? It could be domestic, it could be foreign, it could be something else that we're missing that becomes a disaster in a few months that we weren't able to focus on properly because we're not allowed to have a transition. Meanwhile, of course, there's this pandemic, which is a raging current everyday disaster. That we're not that, talking about. That we, that A, that we're not talking about, and B, that the Biden folks can't get their hands on right. because they're not being given full access. Right. And images uh, do not let us lie. Four years ago, we saw President Trump and uh, a President, yeah, now President Trump, then President-elect uh, Donald Trump with First Lady Melania come up to the White House, meet with President Barack Obama and then First Lady Michelle Obama. Do you think we'll see that image today before January 20th or at all? Well, you know, and ironically, it was exactly four years ago today right, that right. that meeting was held and it was only two days after the election. Right. Our understanding, at least at CBS, is that there are no current plans for such a meeting to take place. Now, if the current president eventually concedes. He hasn't uh, even called. Right, right. President because Joe in Biden. his view, he hasn't conceded. There's no reason to call. Right. So if he does that, maybe then there'll be a meeting. But it's not like Joe Biden doesn't know his way around the White House. For sure, for sure. So let's talk about what's going on legally. From the White House perspective, like I said, they're not going to admit defeat because there is a legal process that has to take place. The Republicans in Congress, starting with Mitch McConnell and down uh, down the line, say that there's no, as Mitch McConnell said, there's nothing wrong with this. There's no reason to be alarmed that this is the process that has to take place and the president has the full right uh, to be entitled to recounts of whatever else that he wants to do within the law. And uh, the president has now filed his campaign on his behalf has filed lawsuits, I believe in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Georgia, uh, Nevada, and if I'm missing any, Arizona as well. So at least those states that he believes that he can still flip and be able to claim victory and get to those 270 votes. Um, how possible do you think this will be? Not that possible. Um, for one thing, while you look at the percentages and see that it may be like 49.4 to 49.3 or uh, 48.6 to 48.2, you look at the raw vote totals and realize that you know Biden is essentially building five-digit leads that are growing. 
every day as the ballots come in. And it's insurmountable at this point because there isn't enough coming from different parts of the state that would support the president that would help him make up these margins. That's a broad characterization of the situation in all these states right now. Um, you know, and there has been no reporting independently. There have been no examples filed in court or any other situation that suggests widespread fraud or miscounting that would significantly alter the results. In fact, tonight, uh, I haven't read this full piece, but I know that there's one example that the House Oversight Committee is now aware of, where a guy in Erie, Pennsylvania, who had initially declared making up allegations of ballot tampering has now withdrawn those allegations under questioning the US Postal Service inspectors saying that he had fabricated, I'm kind of summarizing it here because I just pulled it up, uh, admitting that he had fabricated the allegations. And that was something that the president and his supporters had seized upon. And now the guy's saying it's actually not true. So that's what the president and his team appear to be working with, this kind of stuff like that that isn't holding up either in news reports or even in court, let alone the court of public opinion. Right. Uh, so look, yes, legal recourse and the ability to request recounts are there. In many cases, the president or Republicans are going to have to pay for those recounts. So they're going to have to make a decision. Do you, and they are raising funds. Let's and, not, and I was going to say. Let's they, not forget, they are sending uh, emails multiple times a day asking for money for the legal defense fund for President Trump. And right. within quotes to be able to pay their debt as well. Exactly. I was about to say, the, the, the fine print on this is not only are you helping potentially deal with the recounts and the legal recourse, oh, but we might pay off our campaign debt as well, which right. is perfectly legal, but shows you the dire financial straits that the Trump campaign is in, despite the fact that they had almost a four year head start on Joe Biden in raising money. Right. And I talked to a source today in uh, in Georgia. He used to work with uh, uh, state attorney, or not the secretary of state there. And he says that he sees a civil war within, this is how he described it, a civil war within the Republican Party. Not only in Georgia, but he's seeing this nationwide of those who want to support the president because their political lifelines are also on the line, much like we're seeing in Georgia with that recount for the two Republican senators. And those Republicans who are, you know, just want to move on. Right. No, and I actually think that while the transition is important, essential, and is being complicated now in ways we haven't seen in at least 20 years, the special elections in Georgia ultimately could have more of an effect on the future of the Biden administration in Congress than anything else. We've got to remember, folks, we've never really had one state holding general election runoffs in January, just days before a new president takes office, that could very well determine the future balance of power in the Senate. And if this Republican civil war continues in Georgia specifically, it certainly will motivate supporters of President Trump to turn out. But are there enough of them in Georgia to offset a clear audience and preference for someone like Joe Biden? who is leading and is set to win the state by a decent margin um, and who very well may turn out again to elect one, maybe two of these Democrats who are running in these two seats into the Senate. Right. And so Republicans clearly understand that the stakes are probably higher for them because they don't have control of the House. They're losing the White House. They have the potential here to lose the Senate. But to have both of the incumbent Republican senators calling for the Republican Secretary of State to resign because he hasn't been transparent enough, when many would argue he's ended up fixing and holding uh, a pretty decent and fair and smooth election after some serious problems earlier this year. And he says, I'm not resigning. He says, the President wants to investigate these things. And, and he's and Republican himself. So he yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're throwing one of their own under the bus. And to what end? We don't know yet. We don't know yet. Let's talk a little bit about what happened on election night. Uh, the predictions, the the polls were once again not as reliable as we thought they would be this year. So what trends did we see then? And how can we read the historic voter turnout that we saw uh, before the elections with the early voter turnout and uh, on election day? Well, uh, I will say this about the polling that CBS did. We did project scenarios that showed 
strong Republican turnout on the day of and what that would conceivably do. And they were, in essence, a warning to those that maybe didn't believe it, that yes, Republicans will vote. They had been telling us consistently for months, I'm not going to vote early, I'm going to vote the day of. Well, it's a big presidential election year. Republicans are going to turn out, and they did. And while the Biden operation appears to have sorted that out and won by eking it out in all these states, it clearly had an effect down ballot. And, uh, and so Democrats are, I think, somewhat surprised by it. So, you know, my whole attitude going into election night was everything you know about presidential elections from previous years should be taken <laughs> and put in the trash can because there's no sense in believing that any of those norms are going to hold up in a year where like never before about 100 million people cast their ballots early right that upends your ability to poll properly to get a handle on who's doing it why um you know and and, and anything else so well, I'm not, yeah it's, it's just you know sure blame the polling because they didn't track properly for people's preferences, maybe because people aren't answering the phone, maybe because they lie to pollsters, maybe because the sample size of Trump supporters and conservative voters generally isn't big enough, sure. Maybe but also like- they're afraid of COVID, they didn't know whether they will go out to vote that right. day or where they would be on election day. Right, but also like, you know, I don't necessarily think we have to call an audible and I'm not necessarily defending the polling industry because I'm no pollster and I've certainly been duped by pollsters before. I think we all have, but like everything else this year, this year is an anomaly. And so, you know, we'll have to figure out whether the polling was wrong because pollsters were bad at their job, or if the polling was wrong because the pandemic just threw everything for a loop and it just made tracking anything really impossible. And I tend to think it's gonna be that more than anything else. And anyone who's surprised that Republicans showed up to vote and nearly won the election, just hasn't been paying attention to the last. Well, they weren't watching the rallies, right? right? Right before the president did about 10 to 15 rallies in 48 hours leading up to the elections. And the number of people that were out on under the rain, under the snow, in right. freezing conditions that were stuck somewhere, I think it was Iowa or one of those Midwest states. Uh, so there was enough enthusiasm that they were he was going to get these people to the to the polls. But going to furthermore to about this year being a crazy election year, I, I think it was as crazy. I was in the East Room at two thirty in the morning when the president came out and gave that speech, and I couldn't believe my ears as to what I was listening to. And I, you know, when I walked into that East Room, I was on the phone doing a phoner with. Um, with um with our anchors in miami we're still live none of us at any of the networks had uh, caught at any point we're still on uh, live programming and i kept telling my my folks look this is not a concession speech this is a party i'm walking into a party and we must report it that way because the president at no point will concede tonight and i have i was not leaked to say uh, his speech i did not know I, I didn't have a crystal ball to know what he was about to say, but I could feel from the atmosphere that the president was going to declare a victory that night as he did claiming uh, voter fraud and so on and so forth, things that have not been by any means um, corroborated by any court or, or a state secretary by any of the states. Um, so I think that was also something that we've never seen before that I can remember, nor um, something that we will see hopefully in the future, but it definitely, like you said, changes the dynamic um, of this election. Yeah, yeah. yeah so much of, of the last four years has been norm busting, as we like to say, yeah. and certainly this election year was. For sure. I want to, I have a lot more questions for you and things to discuss, but we do have a couple of questions that I already want to start getting to. Um, so how concerned should we be over Secretary Pompeo's remarks today about a smooth transition to a second Trump presidency. That's what I opened my story with today. I think it was the news of the day. He chuckled. He maybe meant to make a joke, but he captured headlines all over the U.S. and the major networks. What do you think? 
Why, why would he say such a thing? Because he's trying to keep his boss happy and because he's thinking about running for president in 2024. And the best, easiest way to do that if Donald Trump isn't running for president is to keep Donald Trump supporters happy. Um, look, whether or not he really believes that wasn't clear and he didn't offer any clarification when our colleagues who were there to question him asked him to clarify. Um, but he also knows that by saying things like that, it jazzes his boss, the president, jazzes the GOP base, which is critical right now, jazzes the donor base, and keeps him in the conversation as someone who is Trump-like and could be a potential candidate, again, in four years, and may want to be one of those that tries to sort of inherit the Trump mantle or the Trump legacy and carry it forward into the future of Republican politics. We'll see. Yeah, he is the Secretary of State, and he yeah, and his words and his words resonate far more than most Trump administration officials because the world listens to him. So yes, right. it will cause a ripple effect and some worry. But let's also remember that a lot of those world leaders now are clamoring to get on the phone with Joe Biden because they understand what's going on. So it's going to be tricky, I think, for much of the world to read the at least the diplomatic aspects of American government for the next few weeks. But you know. Uh, uh, we'll see. Uh, if he comes out and does something or signals that something that he's trying to do something to put his thumb on the scale um, by using the State Department to do that, that's a, certainly a more serious thing. But for now, um, you know, we should expect to hear a lot of this from Trump administration officials and we'll see whether the bark has bite. Right. And do you think we'll see a lot more firings like Esper's? Uh, I mean, the president himself has said that uh, people like the FBI director are potentially on the chopping block. So we'll see. Right. Right. Yeah. And and this White House is as aggressive as it could be, uh, saying that anyone who's looking for a job <laughs> without the president yeah. proceeding is uh, it will be on the chopping block. Anyone who is a political appointee and can be easily taken out of the federal government. And they have even told the federal government to start or the federal agencies to keep uh pushing those, um, the, the, um, the budgets for next year, as if President Trump was going to continue to be in office. So do you think that on December 14th, when the Electoral College comes together, the vote gets ratified, and uh, we, or they, certify uh, Joe Biden as the president-elect, will this be over then? Uh, conceivably, it should be by then, because by then, you know, states have to start certifying their results in early December, and then the Electoral College will meet, and they've got to report their results to Congress, who will then take it up shortly after the new year. Um, I think what we'll have to watch is whether any of these state legislatures or legislators who have been saying uh, that perhaps a Republican-led legislature might vote and assign its own slate of electors that may differ from the results of the election in that state, really want to go that route. And if they do, how quickly is that settled um, by courts? But there's legal ramification to changing your your choice once you have committed yourself to a- um... Right, but, but remember that, that in some states, the legislature has to send, has to pick the electors. Mm -hmm. And usually it's, they pick these electors and they're going to vote reflecting how the state voted but some interpretations of the law, and I'm no expert on this, and so please don't quote me directly, but right. basically you've got legislatures and legislators in Michigan and Pennsylvania, among others, saying, well, you know, we could just elect our own slate of electors who we know will vote for the president, even though the president didn't win those states. But because the Republicans control the legislature, they feel that they can, they can appoint those electors to vote the way that they want them to vote. The issue is that each state can determine how to do it. So... That is one possibility. Why legislatures would want to do that, though, and then face the potential wrath of the voters a few years later themselves, I don't know. Is it really worth it? We'll see. But again, I think a lot of this right now is just designed to keep the Republican base motivated, not only to help the president with his uh, recount and legal effort, but also, again, understanding that there are two very critical races down in Georgia that the entire national party needs to be focused on by like giving money and giving support. And, you know, uh, it, it'll be messy, but um, 
conceivably, yeah, by the time the Electoral College casts its voters on December 14th, this thing should be settled. However, has anything gone as expected this year? Ah, oh. Nothing is guaranteed. Right. Nothing is guaranteed. And I, leaving what we live at the White House every day, I would not put money on it. I would think that he's going to drag this on all the way to January 20th. And right now, I do not know what January 20th will look like. And I would not venture to bet anything on January 20th. Yeah. Yeah. Let me get to another question. I hate to think about this, but do you think Trump team goes as far as interfering with how states elections cast the electoral college votes in GOP states? I mean, this is what I was talking about. We it's talking. possible. Mm -hmm. It's very possible. But again, will the public will be there to back up the legislators who, who try to do that? And we don't know yet. We don't know yet. Um, we just don't know. But it, I mean, places to watch would include Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, maybe a few others, depending on how things play out. We still had a historic number of people come vote and a historic number of people vote for President Trump. We're talking mm -hmm. about over 71 million people, more so than they voted for President Obama, who had held a record until now. So what does that tell us about the enthusiasm for President Trump and, uh, of course, for President-elect Biden, who got what, we're up to 75 million now, over 75 million, right? Yeah, I mean, look, what it shows is that both sides were able to motivate uh, people to participate, and that's a great thing. If, if this ends up being, if not the highest, then one of the highest turnout races, and that it happened during a pandemic, pandemic right? well, that's just great for all of us. It means the system's working. It means people were inspired to participate. And it means it was a pretty hearty contest. And so far, the guardrails that are in place to oversee these elections are holding. Mm -hmm. And so long as the system runs its course and there is a peaceful transfer of power, um, you know, I think it'll be a great reflection on American democracy, as ugly and messy and confusing as it can be sometimes. You know, a lot of this has been thought out. And a lot of it, frankly, is probably overdue for legal interpretation. So maybe the next few weeks will help clarify some aspects of how all of this should go. At, at Univision, of course, we play, we uh, pay close attention to the Hispanic vote and how mm -hmm. it played into these elections. We saw a historic turnout of Hispanic voters and not all of them, as uh, many may think, voted for Biden. And there was a story today in the, in the Washington Post about how the Rio Grande Valley area overwhelmingly voted for President Trump, even though they are on the border, right. they are a wall town, like really right there. And yet they felt that the Democrats did not do enough to get their attention. Also talking to that same source in Georgia, who I was referring to earlier said, you know what? The, Repo the Democrats in Georgia did not invest any money in getting the Hispanic vote. And had they done this, we might have not been going to a recount today. And uh, this would this could have led to another outcome here in Georgia, had they invested any money in um, in in our state, had they invested many more money in South Florida, which they got to uh, very late. So, how what what are your thoughts on how the Democrats maybe forgot the Hispanic community, even though they did gain a lot of ground in other places like Maricopa County, for example, in Arizona or Nevada. And, um, but other places, they many are still telling us that they felt forgotten. Yeah, I don't know if they were forgotten, but they were certainly taken for granted. Yeah. And Arizona is probably the lone success story for Democrats of how if you take the time and you invest in the people and the money needed and you tailor your message to the community you're targeting, you can win. But a lot of the work that was done to win over voters in Arizona for Democrats was not done necessarily by the Arizona Democratic Party or the Biden campaign. It was done, being done by groups like Mi Familia Vota. Right, grassroots, ground uh, root, groups that had been there for years trying yeah. to switch the state. This is yeah. nothing new, of course. But it is, it is, it is arguably reprehensible right. that the party continues to take Latinos for granted the way they do. And I think you know, there are going to be a lot of conversations in the Democratic Party in the coming years about how things are supposed to go. They've got to have a really serious conversation about this one. You're right. They, sh they, sh they it shouldn't be hard um, in this environment, you would think, to convince the Latino community to not support this president. I mean, that's just fact. That's not opinion. 
Right. But on paper, given what's gone on, uh, I would argue, it, it, and this is the problem. They presumed that everyone would just come along. But what they forget is that we are no different because you and I are Latino, so we can, and we talk about this right. um, frequently. But they, like the black vote, like the white vote, like the woman vote, like the gay vote, like everyone should not be taken for granted and deserves and, and has earned the respect of candidates who come humbly asking for their vote and support. And it's just astounding to me that this party still doesn't seem to get it. And you but have the Republican party and the president, uh, you know. Who say, tried, they were hungry, they figured it out. Yeah, and, they, and they, out they increased the Hispanic yeah, vote by yeah. multiple points this time around. Like, yeah. you know. Je I, I always remember what Jeb Bush said uh, when he was running four years ago that most Hispanics are Republicans, they just don't realize it yet because we have to go tell them or point right. out to them that a lot of the things they believe are what we actually believe. You know, they're socially conservative. Many of them are fiscally conservative. They, they're supporters of, of strong national security um, and, and, democracy they, and, and they're and they anti-abortion. Evangelicals. And, right. Yeah. And yeah. so it's just, you know, and they figured it out in Florida. Uh, and they've done it very well ever since ever since Jeb Bush won in 1998, all the way through to Rick Scott winning his Senate race two years ago. And they were able not only to help President Trump, especially in South Florida, but but they also ousted two uh, Democratic Congresswomen from Congress that had been elected uh, two years prior. Yep. Yeah. So and, it, and it played down ballot as well. Absolutely, and it was a it was a problem for this party for the party in California, where they lost seats problem in Texas where they thought they were going to win seats that they did not. Um, and, and I think a lot of it was just based on arrogant assumptions. And yes, to some extent, a pandemic that made it very difficult to be out and about organizing. Um, but that just proves how hard it is and how essential it is to get out there and find these voters and motivate them. Um, and there are groups like the Libre uh, Initiative, which is this center-right uh, sort of libertarian group backed by the Koch brothers that has spent years organizing and mobilizing in Florida and in Nevada. And I had several sources over the course of this campaign say to me who are more liberal or democratic say, if we can't figure out a way to put together an organization like this that is on the ground constantly convincing people to be on our side, we're gonna to continue to lose the Latino vote. Right. Now, if you're somebody who is a supporter of and believer of and is interested in the future of Latino power in this country, this is fantastic. Because it reminds both parties that we're not a monolith, and we've, yeah, always, we've always known that, and that we should be wooed, and that the party that woos better is going to end up winning more votes. Do you think? Do you think that uh, the Democratic Party and President-elect uh, Biden focused too much on the African American vote, for example, uh, because they knew that they had to get them out. They needed them too, and good for them uh, because they, they also made some uh, strides there. Uh, in comparison to Hillary Clinton, who wasn't able to get the number of African American votes that she thought she would, uh, so was that a shifting focus that maybe did not um, play out the way they sh they would have liked in some municipalities like South Florida? Yeah, I think I think Biden has a unique relationship with the African American community, as he pointed out in his victory speech that Saturday night, um, and so he cherishes and relishes the opportunity to woo and expand his support among African-American voters. And it's always been that way. I'm in Delaware, which is not a state you'd think has a sizable African-American population, but it does. And it's a critical piece of his voting support in this state throughout his career. Um, it saved his hide, frankly, in South Carolina in the primary when Jim Clyburn and his operation backed him up. And we would talk to black voters, especially older ones across the country who said, you know what? He's not Kamala Harris, he's not Cory Booker. I'm not necessarily looking for a black candidate, but boy, oh boy, one who backed up the first black president for eight years and stood by him and was a loyal Lieutenant and a good friend, that's somebody I'll support. So, you know, yeah, he has a better history in relationship with black voters. He struggled and never seemed to want to discuss the Obama administration's immigration policy, which just twist them up in rhetorical knots. I know you guys at Univision always struggled to get him to talk to you at all because right. he knew that the conversation right. would go there. Um, and he just doesn't seem to be as comfortable um, or willing, his operation did, 
in figuring it out. And it's because it's a trickier nut to crack. Uh, as we said, we're not monolithic. He's made a lot of promises for the first 100 days. He has. Migration that will, be have, will have to be done through executive orders. And, and we will see how he can translate that into permanent solution for the dreamers, for uh, the Venezuelans, and all of that he has promised. Yeah. More so than just an executive action that can be taken out, just like we saw President and, Trump do and, for the Obama. And, and you've been in town long enough to know that the last thing congressional Democrats are going to want to do between now and the midterm election is immigration, right? For sure. So for we're sure. probably going to see a replay of what we saw after 2008, yeah. after 2012. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the story repeats itself because that's what happens in Washington. I do have another question. How do we protect journalism as an institution in an era filled with disinformation and mistrust? Is there a way forward besides retroactively fact-checking disinformation once it's already out there? Oh. I think we have tired ourselves. I don't know about you, but every time I, 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 I report on Trump's tweet about for voter fraud. I don't know how many times I've said, there is no evidence of that. There is no evidence of that. There is no evidence of that. I, I just, it, it comes out like automatically almost after every time I say something. So I think just keep repeating ourselves when we report on something that we know uh, may not be truthful, yet we have to report on it because it's coming from the White House or the president and we cannot ignore it because he is the most powerful voice in this country. Uh, I would still argue that that he he is at the moment. Um, so we have to report it, and yet we have to clarify and clarify and clarify until we turn blue in the face. But we cannot stop doing it. Yeah, and I think you know you could spend hours discussing that question. Um, a, a lot of this, I think, has to do with the fact that many of the nation's largest journalism companies or organizations probably need to do a better and faster job of adapting to the way that people are consuming news. Yeah. Uh, hopefully you don't compromise your standards in the process, but you have to understand and accept that the audience is consuming things in a far different way than they used to. And while there is an audience that's still watching us at 6.30 PM every night, there's a segment of the audience that's watching us on DVR whenever they want. Uh, and there's a segment of the audience that just won't watch television because they don't have a television. They've only got one of these. And so, you know, we've got to be there. And, and when we're there, we've got to be just as truthful and nonpartisan and balanced as we are on every other platform. And it's hard. And, and we do have to report like on, on Saturday when the election was called and uh, the statements were coming out from the, uh, from the campaign on behalf of the president, from Ronald McDaniel, the president of the RNC, even though we knew that it, it's not truthful what they are stating in their statements. You have to read them out. And, and this is what, you know, we have to do as journalists. We cannot silence them either um, with a caveat of, well, again, we have not been able to corroborate any of what they're alleging, but this is their side and this is their statement and is um, we, we cannot um, ignore it either. Right. Yeah. And I have another question about the Latino vote. She says, or he, I'm sorry. Um, I want to push back a bit about whether Latinos or other voters based on policy consider, vote on, uh, based on policy considerations. Don't you think US elections have become more candidate centric than otherwise? Put it another way, most voters just did or did not like Trump Biden. Yes and no, I, I do think, I do think issues still matter. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. Um, I, I talked to, um, there's a polling firm called Equis Research, E-Q-U-I-S, okay. and a pollster yeah. named Stephanie Valencia, who I'm sure you've talked to, Janet, mm -hmm. who said that she could see in her polling in Nevada specifically, to some extent Arizona, that the president was managing to eat into the Democratic Party's advantage among Latino men to an alarming degree. I said, why? She said, machismo. They see Trump and they like him because they like the way he goes about his day, carries, carries out his business. For the same reason that a voter from rural Michigan might like the president, so did that guy from Las Vegas who was a Mexican American. And so, yeah. 
again, this speaks to the presumptions that people make incorrectly about different groups of people or how some people might react to things. Yet it was a socialism and the communism issue right. that the president made the center point of his campaign in South Florida that got the voters of the Cubans, the Venezuelans, the Colombians, and, and that was completely issue-based. That was issue-based, but to some extent in Nevada with yeah. a predominantly Mexican or Central American crowd, it was, it was a personality that was enough. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And another question, Bernie Sanders won Latinx voters in historic numbers. Do you think candidates like Xochitl Torres uh, would be successful if they abandoned blue dog ideologies and ran more progressive campaigns? Interesting. Maybe. Uh, but as I recall, Xochitl Torres was running in a predominantly Republican district. Right. Or a historically Republican district. And had had had, had won that race uh, as part of the big blue wave in, in 2018, knowing that it was going to be very hard to hold on to because it, that was sort of carved out and redistricting to be the Republican district from New Mexico. So in a year where Democrats clearly had broad but thin support for the top of their ticket, there wasn't deep enough support for the Biden coalition to be helping a lot of these down ballot candidates. And that's why people like Sochi Torres came up short. What do you think the Democrats learned of this election? That they've still got a lot of work to do. Um, and and that, you know, look, most of the seats they lost, again, were those reach seats that they won as part of the massive anti-Trump wave two years ago. But they were and have been, will be, predominantly Republican parts of the country. So when more Republican voters show up, as they do in presidential election years, and you're a congressional candidate of the opposite party, you got to work twice as hard as you normally would to get your, your supporters to turn out, and there may just not be enough of them. So, you know, and because they came up short in state legislative races in Texas and Pennsylvania and other places, they're not going to have as much say over the redistricting maps, so they may not have as many opportunities to pick up seats in two years. Right. Um, so the fundamentals are, are still a problem for the Democratic Party. If, 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 if the Democratic Party was a was a basketball team, you know, they'd have to work on their free throws and their two point shots because they can't even make those still. And what extent. do you think the Republicans are still learning? Do you think? Well, the Republicans are going to have a, a, a harder time of it, I think, because they first they have to figure out to what factor will be the president and his family. Right. Or is there life after Trump? And is this still the Trump party? Right. Or is it going to be something else going forward? There was news today of a Trump super PAC, right? Uh, uh, leader, a leadership PAC, yes. Leadership PAC, something of the like that may keep him as a power broker of sorts, somebody yep. raising money for the party in the future. I, I tend to think, and this is a very personal opinion, that once this is all said and done, he will not be as front and center in the Republican Party as we think he may be. We'll but who see. knows, right? <laughs> we'll see. Hey, if, if Grover Cleveland could do it back in the day, right? win, lose, run again, and win. Yeah, 2024, if, right? There's talk yeah. about Trump 2024 already. Yeah. And that's what this leadership pack is all about. Right. You know, it'll, it'll allow him a presence uh, either for himself or maybe one of his children or many of his children to remain active in Republican Party politics. And I think it's 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 going to be yet another unique aspect of the Trump era uh, that we're going to have to keep an eye on. In 2024, he would be Joe Biden's age right now, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So exactly. he would not be able to criticize that anymore. No, except <laughs> that Biden would still be older than him. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. How do you expect voter uh, vote splitting in Georgia runoff, specifically the Warnock Purdue pair? You know, I, I actually I made this comment on the air last week. I, I, I think it's kind of awesome for Georgia voters if you're somebody who wants, you know, bipartisan representation. Just pick your favorite Democrat, pick your favorite Republican, and, and vote right? one of each in. And I, you know, who knows? Maybe that's what will happen. Um, and if obviously, that happens, then what's the what's the makeup of the Senate? Okay, so if after today, because they called North Carolina, it's 49-48. Yeah. It would be 50-50. And then- Because the Alaska Senate, because the Alaska Senate race is still being tallied up. 
and um, it's likely to go to Republican Dan Sullivan. It just takes a lot longer in Alaska because it's a big place. Right. Um, so let's say, uh, let me get this right. Okay, so let's say, no, actually I'm wrong. So if it's 49, 48 right now, mm -hmm. and then the Alaska race gets called for the Republican, it'll be 50, 48. 50, 48. But so the Democrats would have to win both seats to 50, get it to 50, 50. 50. And have Harris become the... Have to have Harris be the tiebreaker. The tiebreaker. If it's 51, 49, I mean, like polling, it's basically 50, 50. Um, <laughs> because you'll inevitably have people who swing both ways on certain issues. And how to say how does a Republican majority or simple majority play out for Joe Biden administration? I mean, well, it, it, it screws them in a few ways, potentially, because remember, the Senate rules now are that you only need a majority of senators to confirm cabinet appointments right. uh, and Supreme Court justices. But for major legislation, you need 60 votes. So really, it gives all the power in the world to Mitch McConnell, Mitch McConnell and maybe the 11 most persuadable Republicans. Mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. there are even Republicans to persuade. Right. So it could be, you know, really tricky. Yet they do have a history, McConnell and Biden. They do. Today he said- how much, how, much they, how much will they respect themselves come January that they need to work together for, for the sake of this country, for the sake of getting people money for the pandemic, for the sake of figuring out healthcare, for the sake of- Everything else that will happen in between. Immigration, for example. Do they? I mean, yeah. that's one of the questions that we'll have to answer. Uh, it may not be in the interest of Republicans to do so. It may. Um, and then there'll be a question of if there is, you know, how difficult will compromise be? And it may be very difficult when you have two parties that want to get their way and no other one's way and a president who wants to somehow meet in the middle. You know, because think about the House Democratic Caucus. Nancy Pelosi's got to figure out what the most liberal members are willing to vote for. And if she can't get it from them, she's got to go find Republicans willing to work for her, but there may not be any incentive to do so. And there may not be any that want to because there's such a conservative group of guys and women. You go over to the Senate, where are the dozen or so Republican senators who suddenly are going to be willing to cut deals with Democrats? There will be some that are running in 2022, who have to go back to their big states and demonstrate, look, I worked on these big kitchen table issues like healthcare, like COVID. So is Marco Rubio gonna be willing to compromise since he's up in 2022? Is Rob Portman of Ohio gonna be willing to do that? Is Roy Blunt? Um, maybe not because they may get primaried by members of their party who are more conservative who say, don't do it. Don't work with President Biden don't work with congressional Democrats, and it'll be no different than where we've been for the last several years. So we'll see. And right again, now, this, this you... goes back to my point that I think ultimately in the next few weeks, the most critical thing here is not that the Biden folks are getting in or not getting into these agencies. It's who wins those Georgia Senate seats. That will define his presidency. It could. It could. And, and we have a president-elect that is uh, sending us a, me a message of unity a message of coming together. He's sending that message to Congress of working together. This is his whole rhetoric, right? This is his whole platform. And how could he do that if he doesn't win those two seats in Georgia, if the party doesn't? Right. That's, yeah. that's, that's the big question. And um, we only have about 10 minutes. So I want to get to a couple more things. Um, so so come, come January 20th, how do you think the inauguration will play out? We don't know yet. Um, do you think this, this is my question and I wanted to, to see if we could bet on it. Do you think President Trump stays at the White House to see the change of power? You mean, will he still be there on the morning of inauguration day? Right, right, right. I don't know because it depends on what goes on with those lawsuits and whether he feels compelled to stick around and attend Biden's inauguration ceremony, whatever it looks like. But remember, are, are they gonna have an old man? Sorry, I mean, well, he is, he's 78 years old. He will be by then. Stand out in the cold in the middle of a pandemic. Well, 
they're building the stage right in front should of they the be? office. Should they be? They're building it right in front of the White House. Right. Is it for us, for the media who gets to stand out there? But is the there court? even going to be a parade? And should there be? Not I mean, if how, how uh, the laws are uh, what they are right now, right? And they're restricted. Yeah, but I mean, like, are you going to tell 100,000 plus? Well, it'll be more than 100,000 because... You, well, however many people to show up on the on the mall to watch this when you're supposed to be keeping your social distance. I, I, I again, toss out all norms in history uh, when it comes to how the next few months will play out. If I'm Biden and you're telling everyone to wear a mask and keep your social distance and stay home if you can, why would you throw a big party? No. So will the president be there for it? You know, he might have a convenient excuse, which is Biden's not throwing any parties and Biden just being What's sworn the in under the Capitol. Why should I stick around for that? Right. Well, the stage will be built. I can tell you. I'm here in D.C. It's yeah. happening. Yeah. And yeah. one wonders if it should be. Right. Right. And and like you said, what what is the what is the feel within Biden's um, inside group and that that what what do you think they're thinking about that inauguration? They haven't said much yet. Um, in fact, we should we should expect by the end of this week, early next, to have some sense of who will lead his inaugural committee, mm -hmm. uh, who will lead the fundraising for it, and then who will sort of serve as a director. And, and, and by that, you know, it's literally the program director. And it'll be up to that person to figure out whether it's safe enough and appropriate enough to be holding grand affairs during a pandemic. I would imagine the balls aren't happening. Not not just a pandemic, but a pandemic that is getting worse. Right, right. And is expected to be much worse during the winter months. So yeah, I mean, look, Reagan in 84 did it inside because it was so cold. They did it in the rotunda. Uh, it was a much smaller crowd. Why not do it that way? Uh, and, and would the country really fault you for that? Probably not. Probably not. No, look. The president was the president Trump was trying to make a big deal about Biden not having any rallies, Biden right. not leaving his uh, his uh, basement, uh, right. the masks that he was wearing all the time, and in the end, it didn't seem to have any effect with voters. Nope, nope. If anything, it helped him yeah. because it showed that he was able to carry about his business responsibly. Yeah, without the president being, you know, just being white noise and nothing else. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and I guess the last question before we wrap up, do you think President Trump concedes at any point between January 20th? That'll be interesting. Um, I, I think it would take nothing short of the Supreme Court telling him that all avenues have been exhausted. Do you think this will make it all the way to the Supreme Court? Probably. Some aspect of it will. Mm -hmm. And it may not lead to a ruling. It may lead to them just tossing it back to the previous court. But I suspect that the president will not rest until his justices and the six others get to hear the case. I said on air, uh, I think it was on the Sunday morning show, that I think he will leave the House claiming his own victory, the White House, claiming his own victory, claiming that he won 71 plus million votes, and that's historic. I mean, that's no small task. And that um, somehow the elections, even though the courts couldn't prove it, the elections, he, he's, he won the elections because they were rigged. And, uh, and, and and he'll ask for a rematch in four years. Yeah, maybe four years. That's how I, I think in no way does he concede. That's my prediction. And he will leave the White House with the same tweets that we're seeing today saying we won. We will win big. You know, I'm still the winner or however you want to put it in all caps. Yeah. January 20th, all cap tweet. And the interesting thing will be to see how many millions of Americans still latch on to that and still yeah. yearn for his leadership. And if it sustains itself, that says something. If it doesn't, it shows you that he's just as malleable as the rest of them. But do you think we'll be a divided country if that if that's the way this oh, ends? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, but, but that didn't start with him. I mean, as we've all discussed, he, he's, he's an element of the division that's been going on for a while. Uh, maybe he hastened some of it or exposed more of it, but it didn't start with him and it won't end with him either. All right. We have another fun four years. Um, we have a few more minutes. Any last thoughts on these elections? And uh, two years we'll be here again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. 
it's still being counted up, but it, what, what impresses me most is we appear to have, at least in modern times, a record turnout. Virtually all those ballots have been cast and they've been cast safely and accurately and peacefully. Um, a transition to the next guy is starting. And at the same time, the other guy gets to continue his own legal recourse and as chaotic and unsettling and to some people disturbing as that is to some people, um, that's the way this process works. It's and, so far, and it's, it's democracy. working. Yes. Yeah, it's democracy. Yeah, absolutely. And here we are. So thank you, Ed. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. I'm glad you were able to join us. Me too. We didn't know in the spring, right? That no. Spring. And remember, you and I said we'd do this in person. And uh, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> and here we are. Thank you. Next time in person, somewhere, somehow. Hopefully. Hopefully. At AU, maybe next year. <laughs> I'm there if you're there. Fantastic. Thank you to the Sign Institute. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. Thank you for your time. And hopefully when we talk again, we'll have a new president, whoever it may be but we'll have a peaceful transition nonetheless. Thank you so much and have a good night.